Uh, our speaker is Mordecai McClough. Uh, I would almost say that he's a legend in the field. And so we're very glad that he's going to speak to us and in person. <laughs> so, which is great. Uh, we've been inviting him for several years, and finally, he, he we managed to arrange a visit for him. And so, Mordecai. Well, uh, I don't know where, whether to start with the with the formal things or with the personal things. But let's say that he got his PhD at the University of Colorado in Boulder under the supervision of Richard McRae. and then he did uh, postdocs in Berkeley with um, with Chris McKee. And in with Ken Gill in Chicago and Andy Burkert in Heidelberg, and then he got he got his final uh, his current position at the American Museum of Natural History, where he has been the curator of the astrophysics department. That's a very interesting way uh, that the connection between yeah, museums. Curator, curator. Mm -hmm. Oh, four. Uh -huh. Okay. And then he's got many connections with uh, the Mexican astronomy community. He was the PhD supervisor of Guillermo Garcia Segura, who is at the Institute of Astronomy in, in Ensenada. And then he was the postdoctoral supervisor of Paola and of Javier. And he's the author of about 200 referee papers with more than 20,000 citations. He's got the, he's earned the Alexander von Humboldt Award, uh, which is one of the most prestigious in Europe. And now for the more personal things, Mordecai and I met more than 30 years ago, a fantastic meeting in, in, in Greece, in Crete, at the famous uh, star formation conference. What was it? The NATO conference on star formation. The NATO conference on star formation. And he had just finished his PhD. I was finishing my, my own. And we started talking about these things and we've been in touch forever. And I have to say that Mordecai, together with Lee Hartman, who also had, we had the pleasure of having visiting here, were the, uh, the most influential uh, uh, people to my conversion to gravitationism. Uh, <laughs> especially when we were writing uh, a chapter for Her Stars and Planets 5, or, uh, with, with our discussions really uh, brought me into thinking about the importance of gravity at all scales and not just at the core scale, as was uh, normally thought at that time. And so to, today we have the pleasure of having him talk about the dynamical collapse in molecular class. Mordecai. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all for having me as a guest here. I am so sorry it's taken me so long to visit, and I am learning how much I should and how many reasons I should have come earlier. Um, but I hope that uh, the collaborations that we build uh, during this visit will carry me forward and bring me back here again much sooner next time. Very good. Uh, so I was reminded by the hotel that my name is actually even longer. <laughs> um, so I am introducing myself properly. And um, uh, yes, I am, I am a curator. And in fact, I'm the curator in charge of the Department of Astrophysics, which is a singular title, uh, but one of four curators and uh, probably two dozen scientists who work in the department uh, in New York City. Okay, so we can go back now 50 years and talk about what happened when people started observing molecular lines in uh, the interstellar medium. And they found that these things were ridiculously broad, far above the thermal broadening width. And they concluded that this must indicate some sort of supersonic motion. And quickly, two camps developed. One said, sure, it's supersonic because it's infallible, supersonic. And Goldreich and Kwan already put that idea forward in 1974. And then Zuckerman and Palmer said, now just wait a honking minute. Because if these things are all free falling, that implies a star formation rate that is utterly ridiculous. An order of magnitude or more above the observed star formation. So that can't possibly be it. Well, if the clouds 
die quickly after they start free falling, then it very well could be what's going on. And the reason why you don't have this enormous star formation rate is that most of the gas never forms stars. But that has its own implication. And this is something that we'll come back to later in the talk. That means that the molecular mass must be getting destroyed at an even more, more enormous rate. You must be destroying 200 solar masses per year to prevent the star formation rate from getting out of control, which in turn means that we must form 200 solar masses a year into molecular clouds. And that turns out to be a fairly stringent requirement, but one that is potentially completely consistent with free fall. So let's keep an eye on that 200 solar mass per year, because two thirds of the way through the talk, it's going to rear its ugly head again. And think about when we observe molecular clouds, Richard Larson back in the 80s said, oh, there is a relationship between the velocity, dispersion, and the size of the cloud. And everybody said, oh, that's very interesting. And then 20 years later, our fire said, well, it's not so simple. Because Larson's clouds were all observed in CO, and effectively they all had a roughly constant column density, which was essentially an observational artifact. Because, and this is something that Javier and I uh, worked on in 2002, where if you take constant column density because of optical thickness in the facts, CO gets optically thick quick, so you just see clouds of a certain depth, uh, you will actually get the other Larson's law out for free. But it has nothing to do with clouds actually having constant column density. It's just that you can only see so far in CO. If you go back and think about column density, if you look in multiple species so that you can penetrate through the high column density objects over on this side and compare them to low column density objects that can be observed in CO, you actually find that there's a relationship between the surface density and the virial parameter, this uh, velocity dispersion, uh, over the square root of the radius, okay? And indeed, the, uh, the expected relationship for objects in variable equilibrium is represented by this dashed line. However, an orbital velocity is only square root of two less than a free fall or an escape velocity. So the free fall velocity relationship is this line, square root of two up. Now I challenge you from this observational data to distinguish between these two lines. <laughs> but if you were going to try to distinguish, it would probably end up closer to the free fall than the variable. But let's just say that this is not a clear indication of variable equilibrium. It is a clear indication of gravitationally driven flows, whether they be virial or free fall, we don't know. At this point was made rather clearly by Javier. So to study this in the context of the ISM, and that is important because clouds live in the context of the ISM, um, we did uh, stratified box models, and this is now a very traditional way of studying the ISM. You take a square, you extend it into a rectangle, you run it through the galactic disk. So here's the galactic disk extending out that way. There's a little piece of the Philharpic square. Um, and you know what? I'm far enough away from you all, guys. And you can probably hear me better if I do that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, if you extend this back and forward, um, this now goes 20 kiloparsecs up and down to capture the full fountain flow. And we allow random supernovae, correlated supernovae, 
magnetic fields, heating and cooling, so some sort of far UV field and um, a um, Hebel based uh, cooling curve. So not dealing with the details of the cooling with cold gas, but allowing the gas to cool to cold temperatures and gas self-gravity. Now, the one thing that we are not doing here, and this will turn out ultimately to be quite important, is we're not correlating the locations of supernovae with uh, molecular clouds, and we're not including radiation. Okay, so here are some non-self-gravitating models. So this is a kiloparsec square, and we have supernovae going off both in big chunks, making super bubbles, and here, there, and everywhere, type ones and runaway type twos. And you can see the galactic fountain going up and down. And what we find is that actually this is not a great model because 85% 80, of mass ended up in cold gas. Hmm. And we look at these objects and we say, well, they're turbulent. They are extended. They're dense. Column densities of like over 10 to the 22. Are these molecular clouds? And if they're molecular clouds, and if their turbulence is primarily driven by the clearly turbulent background flow with velocities of you know 100 kilometers per second impinging on them, then these maybe are the quasi-equilibrium objects implied by Zuckerman and Palmer's arguments that molecular clouds should be long-lived, quasi-stable, turbulent, turbulence supporting them against gravitational collapse, allowing only slow star formation. So we said, let's turn on self-gravity and see. And well, we um, messed around and found out. Uh, here's our beautiful turbulent cloud in close up. Here it is in context. It's down in here. Um, and what happens over like five mega years when we turn on self gravity? Does it sit there quasi statically supported against collapse? Well, no. No, it doesn't. In fact, the damn thing fell in post free fall. Because the turbulence imposed from outside was subject to momentum conservation. All these flows out here are n equals a tenth uh, particles per centimeter cube, or n equals one. And this gas in here in the center is up at like n equals 100 and higher. And so if you have 100 kilometers per second come slamming in at n equals one, and momentum is conserved, it's going to drive one kilometer per second flows in the cloud at n equals 100. Now, these collapses do produce, you know, 100 parsec long structures. Here's the snake. That's like 75 parsecs. And here it is in thermal IR, so you can see the regions of local collapse. We didn't have sink particles in this or any way of treating high density regions. And so actually these blobs are just a bad representation of star formation. Okay, so we can think about this in varial parameter terms. Prior to turning on self-gravity, those clouds had varial parameters that looked like this. They were incredible incredibly low burial parameters because their turbulence was so low. They were extraordinarily bound and thus they naturally collapsed as soon as we turned on self-gravity. However, after self-gravity had been acting for a couple of many years, um, after those objects had evolved for a free fall time, if you measured their velocity dispersions, you would get out virial parameters that look like this. They apparently approach virial equilibrium, which just means that their velocities reach gravitational dominance after a free fall time. 
And indeed, this sort of 10 to the minus one to one range is characteristic of real massive molecular clouds. So this is Calvin and Pili at all. Um, and that range for massive clouds is perfectly reasonable, but it has nothing to do with being in very low equilibrium. It has to do with gravitational dominance. Okay, so we can go back and look at sort of the classic Larson's law and ask, before we turn on self-gravity, they're turbulent, that's supposed to produce Larson's law? Well, no, the yellow points are before we turned on self-gravity and their velocity dispersions never got above a kilometer per second, which for a 20 parsec cloud is way too small compared to observations. What happened was as we moved on from turning on self-gravity, the clouds started to collapse and their velocity dispersions increased and they joined Larson's law. And indeed, this is not a resolution effect. So here we took three different resolutions at t equals zero, went from two parsec all the way down to a half parsec resolution. And absolutely not. The external driving does not push you onto anything like Larson's law. And again, think about momentum conservation. It shouldn't. We can look at this in the higher diagram. Prior to turning on self-gravity, this is what our clouds look like. This is what the observations look like. And this, act this version of the higher diagram breaks down the clouds. So you can see CO, ammonia, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, CO, um, NH, ammonia, and CS, it's tracing increasingly high uh, column densities. After we turn on self-gravity and allow the clouds to evolve, they join the higher diagram. Again, gravitationally dominated motions. Okay, so that's talking about entire clouds and their dynamics. Let's look at some detailed clouds that we pick up before they formed clouds and zoom in on them. So the uh, contour is the density equals 100 centimeter cubed contour. And we just watch these three clouds at moderately high resolution, 0.06 to 0.12 parsec numerical resolution. And what we see immediately is that these things form multiple centers of collapse. They do not collapse uniformly towards a common center or center of mass. Rather, they collapse in multiple regions, which certain audience members here might consider to be higher art. And I would not contradict that because that's what they're doing. Um, and so you see this structure where you had a global collapse and then the higher density regions run away and you get centers of local collapse and that collapse drives turbulence because this is a Reynolds number 10 to the 11th flow in any motion, any differential motion is going to drive turbulence. So yes, the clouds are turbulent, but the turbulence is created by the collapse. It's not <laughs> that the turbulence is preventing the collapse, it's the collapse is causing the turbulence. It's a tracer of collapse, if you will. Same is true for molecular hydrogen. You don't need molecular hydrogen to form dense clouds, but molecular hydrogen inevitably accompanies dense clouds. That's a throwaway line that I'm not going to justify here, but if anybody's curious, you can ask me during your question. If you look at the region that's gravitationally bound in one of these clouds, again, the solid contour is n equals 100, which is sort of where it's where molecules form and we're going to observe it as a molecular cloud. The blue traces the entire gravitationally bound region, everywhere where the gravitational potential is bigger than the kinetic thermal or magnetic energy. And you can see that there's this bound envelope that goes down to roughly to the dotted contour, which is the N equals 10 contour. 
And that material is going to continue falling onto the actual cloud. As the cloud comes on, uh, as the cloud collapses, the magnetic field gets dragged in with it. And here's the interstellar field, which has some large scale structure, but also a great deal of turbulent flow driven by all those supernova driven flows, um, maintaining a small scale dynamo, by the way, but that's another set of discussions. But as you push down into the cloud, you're dragging the field with you and concentrating it um, and following along it. So you get an ordered, a more ordered flow. The envelope is actually magnetically dominated outside of the gravitation dominant picture. But as you get into the core, the mass becomes high enough that the gravity drags the field and it moves back into the kinematic regime in the densest parts of the cloud. And thus the field actually loses its orientation with respect to the cloud and sometimes even get rotated around 90 degrees. So outside the cloud, it tends to, you know, you've got an accretion flow that's magnetically dominant. Then you get into the cloud and it gets messed up and may even be parallel to the clouds in many cases. Okay, now clouds are not isolated objects. I insisted on that before and I will insist on it again. And if you look at one of our clouds and we did this for multiple objects and they all behave similarly, so I'm just looking at one. During six mega years, <laughs> this cloud doubled in mass and halved in radius, okay? So material was falling onto the cloud and the cloud was collapsing. Both were occurring. Um, in the paper, we actually demonstrate that the collapse of the cloud is generating most of the kinetic energy of the cloud. So the hypothesis that accretion onto the cloud was dominating the kinetic energy what did not bear out. It's actually the accretion onto the cloud increases the mass but it's the collapse of the interior that drives the kinetic energy because that's where all the energy is. And we can look at this several different ways. So this is a time sequence from zero to five mega years. At this point, the clock, excuse me, it's just warm. Uh, so the RMS velocity, the alphane velocity and the sound speed are pretty similar to each other. Uh, this is the rotational velocity of the average rotational velocity of the cloud. Okay. And then as time goes on and the cloud collapses, the central velo RMS velocity increases well beyond the rotational velocity and it becomes supersonic and super alpha. Now. What's driving that central increase in velocity? It's the gravitational potential in the interior. And this is my point about why collapse is so important. So as you go on, your um, gravitational potential increases above the kinetic energy, above the magnetic energy, above the thermal energy. And then everything starts falling down the potential. So now your kinetic energy and your magnetic energy increase, but they can't catch up to the potential because they're being controlled by it. So they just keep falling in. And here we've gone, you know, an order of magnitude increase in central energy driven by the increase, the, the potential getting dropping. Okay, last way of looking at the same question is to do direct force measurements. So we actually took each point in the cloud and asked, what are the forces acting on that point? There's the gravitational acceleration. There's the Lorentz force, the green. 
and there's the pressure gradient, okay? And again, as time goes on, the gravitational forces dominate on average at every point in the cloud. The magnetic forces are subdominant, pressure gradients even more so. So this is in some sense a quantitative exploration of what is driving the dynamics of clouds? And the answer is gravity. Right. Okay. Now, way back at the beginning of the talk, I warned you. Clouds collapse quickly, feedback destroys them quickly, then we must be forming clouds. Oh, no, I'm just, I, I'm just up to feedback. Then feedback must destroy them quickly. So how do we model that? Um, I've been working with a number of collaborators, including, uh, well, led by a student named Josh Wall, who in a previous career, before he became a physics student, um, was a detective in a rural Tennessee police force, <laughs> got tired of the good old boys messing up his crime scenes, and uh, decided to go to college so to join the FBI and got seduced by physics along the way and built a, an amazing framework that couples FLASH, which is a magnetohydrodynamics simulation code with self-gravity and radiation, to the AMUSE framework, the astrophysical multipurpose software environment. AMUSE allows multiple simulation tools to talk to each other on a time step by time step basis. And so if you take an in-body code and a stellar evolution code and an MHD code, they can all run simultaneously. And you can get high quality in-body models of a stellar cluster with the gas and with the stars emitting feedback according to their evolution phase. And so here is how it works. You take the flash code, and it generates a gas distribution that has a potential. And that potential, using uh, the Fuji E at all, uh, gravity bridge is transmitted on basically a kick, drift, kick basis to the stellar dynamics code. That code then returns positions of stars. It's hooked up to a stellar evolution code that tells us what the UV flux is and what the mass is that allows us to derive winds, outflows, and ultimately the time of supernova. Um, Steve McMillan uh, and uh, Simon Portuguese Spart uh, developed uh, Amuse. Ralph Klesson and I collaborated on many of the, um, in, the uh, developments in Flash to allow feedback to be treated. And this allows us to evolve clusters. And here's just a, a column density of uh, a cloud. The stars here are projected in three dimensions, but this is a, oh, actually, no. And this is column density in um, the image as well. So getting up to like 10 to the 23. The little stars here are sink particles. This big blue object is an ionizing star, and you can see it's H2 region blowing the gas away. Star formation is continuing in the edge. That's kind of triggered star formation. Here's the uh, pillars of creation being formed by the H2 region running into the turbulent cloud. You can see that very characteristic um, ionized structure. So this is now an evacuated cavity with a little bit of star formation on the edges, another nearby cluster, this, there's another uh, brim cluster. And if we watch that in, in temperature, this is now a slice. So the stars are going to start forming a little ahead and behind of the slice. But when the massive star comes on, we'll see the temperature go from you know, a, a few hundred Kelvin up to 10,000 Kelvin for the ionization and a million Kelvin for the stellar wind. And so here is the massive star, and there goes the ionization, and there's the stellar wind level. And that chews up the dense gas, and it all becomes 10 to the fourth K gas, and goes sweeping away at 10 kilometers per second, 
And that is that for this part of my five. Okay. Well, that relied, that story relied an awful lot on that massive star. And so we got curious about, well, how important is that massive star to what happens? And so we took, so we did a physics experiment. First, we just allowed a cluster to evolve with a random distribution of masses. So basically when material starts collapsing, we uh, start drawing from the IMF and whatever the next mass star in that list is, as soon as the sink particle accumulates that much mass, it gets produced and starts evolving. So on average, most stars are low mass, eventually a high mass star will form and things will go. And that produced this object, which starting with 10,000 solar masses of gas in like a turbulent sphere, we produce 3,500 solar masses of gas. So 35% total star formation efficiency, which is not outrageous, but certainly large. And this little thing was the half mass radius. So all that mass is extremely sensitively concentrated. Then, just by hand, just as an experiment, Sean put in either a 50, a 75, or a 100 solar mass object as basically the first star in the list of the first thing. And then let everything proceed as normal. And it was a completely different result. You didn't get a single centrally concentrated cluster. Instead, you got these little rather diffuse subclusters with dramatically less mass. Even at 50, we have 1,200 instead of 3,500 solar masses. And here we are down, when we put a really massive star, we made like 600 solar masses, maybe 800. Um, the star, that one star changed everything. And here you can see a three-dimensional um, visualization of the gas distribution showing how having that star just cleared the gas away from the center very quickly and left these little isolated regions that could still form stars. And you can see that quantitatively here, where without a early forming massive star, um, you collapse fairly significantly. Now, just to be clear, this was a physics experiment. We don't actually expect star, it, massive stars to form first thing in the formation of stars. But it does emphasize how important the formation of massive stars is to the formation of star clusters and how much it controls the properties of that cluster. And indeed, the fact that massive stars start um, dispersing the cluster promptly from their radiation may well uh, control the cluster mass function. And that's a set of experiments that Eric Anderson, a postdoc in my group, has uh, recently put up on archive, uh, which a couple of you uh, heard about earlier today. Uh, you can ask me any questions. Okay, let's go to bigger things. Can I ask a question? Do you maintain the planet solar mass for more than six million years? Is that what this blue line means? Um, that blue line just means that we put 100 solar masses into that cluster. I believe it either went supernova or drifted off the grid well before the end of that run. So now that 100 solar mass didn't stick around for the full six million years. That was just the 100 solar mass run. But also it didn't start at the equal zero, huh? It, I mean, oh, oh, oh the okay. So T equals zero was where we started allowing our somewhat arbitrary turbulent sphere initial condition to yeah. start collapsing. This is when the first star is actually born. The 100 solar mass star took a little longer to accumulate for any star to form just because it had to accumulate 100 solar masses into a single mm -hmm. thing instead of, you know, 0.7 yeah. or 50. So it's not 6 million years. No. Oh, I see. You well, know, but it's still four, yeah. four and a half. Yeah. Which you're right. That a hundred solar mass star would be gone by then. 
Okay, let's think about bigger clusters. So globular clusters, unlike every kind of smaller cluster that we have observed, do not appear to have a uniform uh, metallicity in the population in the cluster. So if you look at the Pleiades, every star has the same metallicity. But if you look at globular clusters, you find that there's a spread across the main sequence indicative of variation in uh, metal abundances. And for a long time, it was thought that the higher metallicity objects uh, stars were centrally concentrated. But recently, it's become clear that it's random. Sometimes it's more centrally concentrated. Sometimes the less polluted stars are centrally concentrated. Um, and the behavior among clusters is heterogeneous. Now, that's probably being controlled. Why, uh, no. Why are globular clusters special? The answer is probably that they're the objects big enough to retain gas after it's been ionized. And so if you pollute your surroundings and you can cool that gas down to sort of the ionized warm medium, it will be retained in the cluster and can participate ultimately when it cools further in further star formation. Um, whereas smaller clusters, as soon as they emit metals, they're gone. So we're trying to model the distinction between these are backwards. I'm so sorry about that. This is 10 to the sixth, this is 10 to the fifth, and that's 10 to the fourth. We're trying to model clusters of different sizes with the ultimate goal of seeing how their metals get mixed at these different masses. And we're not there yet, but we're getting very close. So Brooke Pollock has run models with 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, and 10 to the 6 solar masses. Over time, you can see the clusters starting to form. And you can see the gas getting blown away easily by the low in the low-mass clusters and with great difficulty in the high-mass cluster. Um, now, we had to make a number of approximations to be able to run clouds this massive. Um, we got rid of all the low-mass stars. They're not going to affect the gas structure of the cluster. We mass-loaded the winds so that they'll still um, clear away enough gas for H2 regions to start expanding, but stellar wind bubbles won't be as big as needed. That's probably okay because stellar winds are 10% of the supernova energy, and supernova energy is 10% of radiation, and therefore stellar winds aren't that important compared to the radiation. Um, and we only took about 90% of the radiation by limiting it to only coming from stars greater than 20 solar masses. But again, radiation is hugely nonlinearly dependent on the mass of the star. And so the very most massive stars have almost all the radiation. Um, and uh, we used a current generation uh, N body code called PTAR that uh, does all sorts of clever tricks like slowing down the binaries so that you don't have to take many, many, many steps to get the tiny binaries going uh, while you're trying to evolve an entire cluster of millions of stars. Um, and with all that, we've actually started making progress. And so we can um, see these uh, objects forming. And one thing to notice is that particularly for massive clusters, the sub collapses matter because these structures are now going to take long enough to fall together that significant stellar evolution can happen within them prior to agglomeration into the end globulum. And that allows for things like mass, a young massive binaries to locally pollute the gas and produce differing a, a subclusters with differing pollution before they all fall together. 
And this is an idea that I've been pondering but not publishing on. And so I have to give credit to Ralph Kudritz and his group um, for having published a paper in 2019 making that suggestion. In short, the multiple populations may not be temporarily separated, they may be spatially separated. Do you include the post one sequence massive cell evolution with all those wave phase? Yes. We, so the UV goes up and the winds change during warfare, and um, then they have supernova. And, and do you have a maximum mass for the star? Because these are very 10 to the 6 stellar masses plus a different way to get supermassive star. Yeah, so uh, we did not include um, the uh, sort of mass as a function of maximum mass as a function of cluster mass that Paulo Kupa has promoted. Um, and we've already started getting emails from him about this. <laughs> um, but it, in, in some sense, that's inevitable just because. We're going to make fewer draws and have fewer lottery ticket chances to get that massive star in a small cluster, but they're probably more um, physically based reasons for it that I would love to incorporate someday. Okay. Um, but we can't produce an IMF in these models. We don't have the resolution. And frankly, we don't have the physics to do the IMF. Because to do the IMF, you need to be able to do accretion disks. And to do accretion disks, you need to be able to do non-ideal NHD at the like AU scale. Otherwise, you're not going to get your fragmentation right, and you're not going to get your binaries right, and you're not going to get your IMF right. And trust, consider carefully before trusting anybody who tells you about this. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you can see that in the very massive cluster, um, you're just starting to get these very small H2 regions. And so we're actually like starting to pick out the compact and ultra-compact phases. We don't really have the resolution yet um, deal with ultra-compact, but we're working on how to zoom in on this. And actually, um, I've been having some fruitful discussions with Manuel, who is somewhere in the audience. There he is in the back. Um, who uh, I think we may have some ways to, to substantially speed this up, which I'm quite excited about. And here's some quantitative uh, results. So these are all per free fall time, which of course for the massive cluster means everything's moving much faster. This is less than a mega year for the massive cluster. It's like five mega years for the low mass cluster. Um, but you can see that they have quite, so far, quite um, parallel star formation efficiencies. You can see how their half mass radius drops. And then as the gas gets dispersed, it's released, especially for the lower mass cluster. It was being held in by the gas. You get rid of two thirds of the mass of the cluster and it just starts going. And that's probably realistic. Um, this is a question, please. <laughs> Do you reproduce the observed uh, luminosity velocity dispersion relation? We haven't that? done that analysis. Ask me again when I have a chance to take notes, okay. and um, you know, let's figure this out. Mm -hmm. um, the answer ought to be that we would. Because we certainly are, we, the analysis we did do that I don't have in talk is we did mass segregation. And yes, these objects do mass segregate just like you'd expect. And if you're mass segregated and you've got all your massive stars down in the center, I would expect that we're going to see things um, like Vianney has seen in her turbulent boxes. Um, but we never did that test. Um, so yeah, we have to talk about that. Um, here's the virial parameter for the gas and solid lines showing that, well, when you blow away the gas, away it goes. Um, the 10 to 6 is still bound after, you know, all this star formation. Um, and the same for the stars. When you take away the gas, the stars are no longer bound and they're expanding as shown. So this is an OB association. This may be forming a cluster, though. Let's see. 
This is this um, ran into a crash in the end body code, and we're trying to attract the attention of the developer. And I hope we'll be able to move forward soon. Hey, in which unit is the architect success here? Uh, the uh, three fault times for the for whichever cloud was being considered at the at t equals zero. Are you keeping running the the large mass simulation? We are going. To, we are trying to. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, we do have. We do have a a nasty little bug that's getting in our way. Um, but since Brooke Polak needs to uh, start applying for jobs this fall, we have a very strong incentive to uh, fix that bug. <laughs> okay. So we can destroy clouds. Now, if we destroy clouds, then we have to form that. And well, there are popular ideas about how to form clouds. You can sweep them up, collide them, or you can just let gravity do the job. And some people liked colliding flows very much, but maybe that's just an approximation to gravity. Well, let's try and do this quantitative. So suppose it were supernova. Okay, we know how big super uh, the shells created by supernovae will be. We can do that dynamically. Um, and if there's approximately on average one supernova every 40 years in the galaxy, we're overdue. We're very overdue. The last supernova in our galaxy is like 400 years ago. Anyway, if there were a supernova every four, 40 years on average, then, and we need to make 200 solar masses per year, keep the molecular pop, the molecular fraction high enough, even though we're sitting here destroying clouds as soon as they collapse. That means that every supernova had better sweep up 8,000 solar masses. Okay, and we can decide how much molecule formation we're actually going to um, have by saying, okay, well, you need to... Form, get the shell dense enough, form molecules before the shell disperses. Here's the um, shell, um, the uh, molecule formation rate. It's giga year over the density. It's very easy to remember. Um, and so you have to get the, sh the shells up to like 30 or 40 per centimeter cubed in order to form molecules in them before they disperse. Okay, so that's a criteria. And we can take set off Taylor blast waves and put them into an N equals one medium. And if you just assume that they're purely adiabatic, actually it's pretty good. But are supernova adiabatic? They're not. So if you take into account that they have radiative interiors, mm, they don't get out as far. So this is using the uh, Chalfi, McKee, and Birchinger solution. Um, but that's, you know, maybe okay. Except that most supernovae don't go off in the N equals one ISM. Most of them go off in clusters. And the thing about a clustered supernova, well, if you look at the set of equation, it's that the radius goes as the energy to the one fifth power. So if you take 10 or 100 supernovae, and put them into a cluster, you get something whose radius is only 10 to the one fifth or 100 to the one fifth power bigger. So you don't sweep more efficiently by clustering the supernova, very much to the contrary. It turns out that once you take into account that supernovae are in super bubbles, you only get about 500 solar mass per supernova. Per supernova. Now, we took the, the number of supernovae per super bubble to be 40, and you can actually make arguments about how big a super bubble will blow out of the plane, and you might be able to get it up to 800. That's covered in the paper, but it's still much less than 8,000. So clustered supernovae, which is the natural form of supernovae, do not produce enough stars. 
Okay, people are leaving, which tells me that even though we got started, it is noon and I should move along. So let's just quickly think about gravitational instability and then we'll come back to some other topics. Uh, you can find when something will go gravitationally unstable by asking, is the free fall time faster than the time needed for a sound wave to cross that region and equalize pressure again? Here in this room, sound waves travel much faster than gravity drags stuff together. So we're stable against collapse, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, but you can then derive a wavelength that doesn't satisfy this, and that gives you essentially a genes criterion in a uh, in a disk. Okay. Now suppose you are differentially rotating, then you have another criterion. Suppose you take your region and you shear it out before you can collapse. That will also prevent collapse, and that gives you a different criterion. This is a less than. This is a greater than. So for collapse to occur, you need something that sits in between those two inequalities, and that's the tumor condition. And this derivation, this heuristic derivation, is actually from uh, Yoke Shea's work. Okay, so if you have a uh, gravitational instability, you can derive the time scale for that gravitational instability taking into account both the stars and the gas. And if you put that into our, the equation for molecule formation, you actually get 300 times solar which satisfies that original 200 with plenty of room to spare. So gravity is effective at driving gas into dense regions and forming molecules quite naturally in a rotating disk with no muss, no fuss. Supernovae, because they're clustered, cannot do the job. Okay, I'm going to skip this part um, and just talk about how are we going to connect those scales. So this is a model uh, that Kui Li and Federico Marinacci developed using the Arepo code that Volker Springer and his group wrote. And this is a whole galaxy model with a feedback um, uh, set of feedback mechanisms. That's the smuggle part of this. And Wei Li then did zoom ins on different regions in the galaxy, like this one. So this is a five kiloparsec bar. Here's a 200 parsec bar. So this is about a kiloparsec squared um, zoom in. And um, these were done in, in, a, in a Voronoi mesh array. Bar. But we would like to form star clusters to these. So Sean Lewis wrote a converter that takes the Voronoi mesh <laughs> distribution and puts it on a hierarchical adaptive grid, an AMR grid, that is suitable as to be an initial condition for a flash run or indeed a torch run. And so you can either take the whole region or even just focus your refinement in and we use a muse to transfer the data around and interpolate it onto the correct adapted grid that captures the flash, uh, the Voronoi mesh particles. And here's an example of a run where you can see the background flow running and <laughs> there's the star formation. And by golly, there's a filament. And that is how star formation actually acts. And all this material can accrete onto that filament. And at that point, we ran out of computer time <laughs> and Sean had to graduate. But you can see the possibilities for more realistic star formation. And this is where we stand. So I've brought you right up to the present day in my work. And I'm looking forward to perhaps working with several of you to continue some of this work and uh, learn more about star formation at these scales. Thank you very much.
Well, we have great. Thank you. Um, sorry. <laughs> so this is uh, stereophonic. <laughs> so thank well, thanks, Mordecai, for this wonderful talk. And so should we start with questions in the audience? And yes. The, uh, the so we, we started about 10 minutes late, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. We'll start with the audience and then see if we have questions in Zoom. Okay. So let's see some hands here. Questions here? Oh, okay. We're going to have a good point of feedback discussion scouts. So initially you you were like very bold saying that it always breaks the clouds, but then you show this uh, uh, grid of ten to the four hundred five hundred six, and I think you briefly mentioned that at the, at the higher masses you have evidence that feedback. It, it's so more, far is less so effective. Far, more for, yeah, exactly. yeah. So, I don't think it's going to be ineffective, uh -huh. but I think it's going to be it's going to take longer, and we're going to get higher star formation efficiencies before it disperses. And my impression is that that's probably consistent with our observations of really massive star clusters, is that they actually really have fairly high star formation efficiencies. Right. So um, you see evidence of uh, increasing efficiencies, at, at least in a localized way? Yeah. At, at now, do we, are we going to get a low star formation efficiency for free fall time, given that free fall time is very short in these mass clusters? That I consider to be something of an open question. We haven't pushed this really far enough to be able to tell that yet. Um, but it's something that is going to be a very interesting topic of investigation. And indeed, a further step uh, that, like Mark Trumbull's has been promoting now, uh, is that maybe one needs to think about even the low mass feedback from stellar jets in those regions of fast star formation to see if that will slow down the local region, even though the global thing is still falling in. Uh, Sabrina Oppel is a student at Rutgers, uh, Lakesley Burkhardt's, and she's about 90% of the way to building jets into Torch. So we can start planning with that. Although the computer time uh, requirements are going to be somewhat daunting, <laughs> but. I'm still optimistic that we'll be able to make some progress there. So, questions? Please on. But you still have some way to go to arrive to a 5% star formation efficiency, no? I mean, you globally, have higher, higher, higher values. Yes. How Glo you so, globally, um, if we are the, since all the little clouds disperse quite quickly, um, what we now need to see is with a realistic distribution of initial conditions. I mean, most of the models I showed you were these entirely artificial turbulent spheres where we picked some, you know, surface density and we picked some um, a concentration and let it rip. And they rip. They have high velocity dispersions. But if you go back and look at a realistic, let that go. There we go. If you look at a more realistic set of, of um, surface densities, are they really going to make it up to the behavior of our turbulent spheres? I, I hope and suspect not, but until we actually do these runs, I can't prove it to you. Thank so you. it's a hypothesis. But thank you for a very nice Thank you for attending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I'm I'm very ignorant on the topic, but I just wanted to know uh, when you say you you deactivated self gravity and then you put it back. By self gravity, is just the gravity of the material, or is that or also the environment, like fire alarms in a galaxy? Okay, no, that's a fair question. So what we meant by we never de we never we never deactivated self gravity. We just never de hadn't turned it on yet. But what we mean by it is just the local gravity of the gas. So in the in the uh, stratified box models, the stratification was produced by a background gravitational potential that was acting throughout the model. So the global, let's say. The global okay. stellar gravitational potential and global gravity. It, well, really, it's really the stellar gravitational potential because these are you know, galaxies with 5% gases. Um, in a galaxy, uh, like a primordial galaxy, it's all gas. You actually have to take the gas self gravity into account. But in this sort of modern simulation, it was just sitting there stuck in a larger potential. 
Um, in the global galaxy models like Smuggle, everything is live. So there you have a dark matter halo that's actually particles that are dynamic. You have stars, background stars, old stars that are dynamic. You have young stars that are dynamic, and you have gas that's dynamic. Yeah. Um, and what are the, the boundary conditions in the last model that you show in these boxes? In this in the smuggle model? Yeah. This is an isolated galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the, the dream is to do a cosmological model and then get all the way down to the star cluster scale. Um, will that happen during my career? Who knows? <laughs> we'll see. So, so that, I, I, I would just um, stay on, on Javier's side, uh, line of thinking. And I've always wondered what you do with the boundary conditions of the zoomed in region. And you in particular, make, so, when you yeah, yeah. transfer from one yeah. grid to another. Okay. The answer is you try and make your grid big enough that the problems at the boundaries don't reach the region of interest before your the dynamical time of the cluster formation. Okay, so for you for but you forget about the, the conditions outside of that. Well, now ultimately what we want to do is take the clusters that form and then subject them to the tidal field of the larger galaxy. So yeah, we're gonna have to think carefully about how to make those transitions as seamless as possible. So I should say, I sh just before you uh, come up to the next question, a further answer to your previous question is that the other direction you go is for galaxies. And so that's actually something that um, Andrew Emmerich's work with star-by-star -star modeling of entire isolated galaxies, um, we have now extended into the cosmological context um, in the EOS simulations being read, led by uh, G. Brower and um, Mead and uh, that I'm participating in. And there we actually do have a cosmological box. We've got star by star formation. What we don't have is a true end body code. Um, so the clusters tend to dissolve a little quickly, but uh, we are following star by star dynamics and like elemental abundances and that sort of thing. So we're, we're approaching it from different angles. Okay, you had another question. Though. Well, no, only that uh, wouldn't be useful then if, if you have these close-ups to provide continuously the, the input from the large model? Well, you need to have accretion in order to model a cloud. And if you don't, you're going to get a cloud that goes away way too fast. And that's something uh, that we emphasized already in 2017 that Mark has now emphasized, and Mark Kronholtz is now emphasizing that to explain apparent observed five lifetimes, you must have continuous creation. Uh, we've got three people busy. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, looking at the simulations and that you can trace individual objects, uh, is it possible in this kind of simulations to trace or to have a fraction of binary stars or multiple star systems? Yes. <laughs> um, and in fact, that was a significant chunk. That was uh, Claude Cournoyer Cloutier's master's thesis, was including a binary population torch. And it turns out that it doesn't make a huge difference to the early evolution of the cluster, but that if you don't do it, you will not get out the observed binary fractions, especially for low mass stars, um, which tells us that primordial binary formation, like down in the disks, is more important than dynamical binary formation by single stars encountering each other in, in triples or higher order and uh, forming binaries. Although we can do that. If you just start with single stars, you do get massive binaries. And probably enough to be pretty much consistent with the uh, observations, but uh, a lot of those are big, little uh, binaries that can't actually be observed. So if you look at the observed values, uh, but uh, primordial binaries, yes, they're important. And yes, uh, we have them. And frankly, we need to, we're going to need to take more advantage of that to understand things like runaway stars, which also turn out to probably depend on primordial binaries. In your um, high mass uh, cluster simulations, have you done the radiative 
radiating transfer of those uh, simulations? So the, we have not done um, like observables from that yet. Yet they're still running. Um, the the radiation transfer that's running now is just one bin of ionizing radiation, one bin of non-ionizing radiation. So we do have things like escape fractions of ionizing radiation, and that analysis is ongoing. And uh, Brooke will be leading a paper on that. Well, as soon as we finish that 10 to the 6 solar mass run. Um, however, taking that data and doing uh, like a line transfer uh, analysis uh, is totally a goal for the future. And frankly, I would be excited about collaborating with people on that. And another quick question. <laughs> I would not resist to ask about uh, maybe doing um, uh, at larger scales and doing some um, approximation like Seldovich uh, approximation for the evolution of the gravitational collapse of these kind of systems, and then use that, that conditions to input to the simulations or something like that. Now, the current Seldovich uh, approximations are very good for reproducing local uh, large scale, scale structure. So maybe it's a way to input cosmological conditions. On yeah, well, I would actually take it a step further and say that most large-scale structure models, like EOS and pretty much any other standard model, takes Seldovich to take you from linear to nonlinear and only starts evolution of gas dynamics after you've already set up the nonlinear stage. So that's almost the standard technique. Um, which means that anything we haven't done yet because of computational time isn't going to win from that because it's already been done. I'm going to check if people on Zoom have. Uh, uh, hay uh, otras preguntas en Zoom? I don't see anything coming in here. Yeah. Uh, okay. one, one, one question. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have lots of questions and comments, but. Like, One that, however, it is yeah, I think, I think, I think like the, the deepest one among those. Oh, okay. okay, promise? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, you mentioned essentially that gravity is making the clouds um, for that. So basically, it took the, the, the time scale implied by the uh, tomb ray uh, analysis on the diffuse gas. Yes. So does that mean? that you're essentially saying that even the diffused gas is collapsing as fast as it can? Yes. So fast as it can. Uh -huh. Which is very fast. Which, that's which, enough. Uh -huh. and, and the velocity dispersion that characterizes it, is it coming from the supernova explosions or is it from the galactic? Uh, well, you can have a chat with Bertrand from Holmes about that. They would tell you that it's supernovae uh, for modern galaxies, but if you get enough gas, gravitational turbulence dominates. And is that right? I've seen complaints and critiques, but I haven't been convinced that it's wrong yet. Yeah, because the, the, the reason I'm asking this is because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, because Bruce Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. Okay. <laughs>